So this is kind of a fun slash scary uh, article that I was looking at a little while ago. And that is an article about climate change. So you know how we've been hearing since we were kids that climate change is going to be serious, you know, and we are starting to see, obviously, plenty of folks who live on the West Coast have to deal with smoke from wildfires every year, the sky turning bad colors, you know, that's happening over in New York um, from Canadian wildfires now. Even here in the Midwest, like, I'm, I'm on the Great Plains. I'm in Kansas. It's, like, pretty... Our weather doesn't really get too severe because of where we are, but generally speaking, yeah, like our summers have been hotter, summers have been longer, winters have been colder, sh definitely shrinking springs and fall time. It's not a good moment. Um, and we do have air quality issues from wildfire smoke sometimes, even though we don't really have wildfires here. We're talking shit from Canada and Colorado that gets blown here. We are starting to see the effects m more even in our sort of insulated communities, you know, we think, oh yeah, if you live on the coast, sure, you're getting hit by it a lot. It's more apparent that there's climate change happening. So I guess that's why it comes as, as a surprise to me that the predictions are starting to accelerate quite a lot. You know, when we would have, in 20 years ago, the predictions might have been, we're gonna have serious issues with this particular climate change thing at 20, 80 but in actuality like now the updated predictions is that we're going to be dealing with it in 2050 you know it seems like there's definitely sort of an exponential relationship with a lot of these things and so i was reading this article about preparing for water shortages because um uh, this article opens by saying you know scientists from practically every field have been predicting this for years global demand for water will outgrow our supply by 40 percent before the end of the decade by 2050 or sooner, 5 billion people will face water shortages, which is going to include people in places like America. So, you know, this is just a reference. Um, I went ahead and clicked through to the Guardian article. Global freshwater demand will outstrip supply by 40% um, by 2030, say experts. Yeah, world is facing an imminent water crisis with demand expected to outstrip the freshwater supply by 40% by the end of this decade. Yeah, and so this is just basically going on and it's sort of explaining that research. The Global Commission on the Economics of Water co-chair says, we need a much more proactive and ambitious common good approach. We have to put justice and equity at the center of this. It's not just a technological or finance problem. Yeah, because who's gonna get access to clean water is gonna be a pretty relevant question. Looking at increases in water consumption. Some countries use many more times the amount of fresh water than is readily available to them. Okay, so this is like a proportionally, they use more water than is available in these areas. And we're pretty bad, like truly in the United States, you know, we're pretty bad about using more water than is available. And, you know, for us, it tends to be, it, it tends to go into stuff like, you know, washing machines. Um, obviously, other parts of the world don't necessarily have those kinds of amenities, but, and obviously in hotter locations, like these are all hot places, they're gonna be using a lot of water and people need to use more and more water, like the more the climate change stuff happens. So this guy, yeah, this article kind of goes into a little bit more detail about it. And yeah, water is fundamental to the climate crisis. There will be no agricultural revolution unless we fix water. Oh my God, need to, I'm speaking of that, I need to drink more water. Yeah, lawns, that's another thing too. Lawns are a big, water consumption thing in the United States. Yummy water. Okay, so I guess, you know, since just, just uh, briefly cover right at the beginning, FYI, BT dubs, by 2050 or sooner, 5 billion people will face water shortages. You know how there are like, what is it? 7.8 billion people on the, on the planet? Like probably getting close to 8 billion by now. But so like the majority of human beings on the planet are gonna be dealing with water shortages. <laughs> So this article is gonna kind of go over some of the, and we'll just kind of briefly look through it. We're not gonna go into detail on each one, but here are some different ways that you can combat that and survive. So you could harvest rain. If you have a place where you live permanently, you can harvest rain in barrels. Um, only certain kinds of roofing produce safe drinking water, such as metal and slate. You would have to install a filtering system, change those filters on a regular basis. If you want running water, you would need a pump and a connection to the plumbing system. Uh, that all takes time and money. So you could look into that. Rain harvesting, 
rain catchment systems, da da da. You can store water. Obviously, you can only store so much water at a given time. You could dig a well, but you would also have to filter it. And, you know, you might not be able to, You, of course, you would have to set up running water in a way that, like, unless you don't, you know, you don't have to have running water in a survival situation. You could just, you know, heat up some water and then use it to wash your body as, as you do when you don't have running water. You could get a water generator. The unfortunate thing about those is that they usually use electricity. So if you don't have electricity, then that could be a problem. But a water generator uses the same technology as dehumidifiers, but the parts are all food safe, as opposed to, you know, if you just drank the water out of a dehumidifier, it would probably have a bunch of really bad shit in it from the air. And like also the parts of the machine itself are not food safe. So there could be leaching from the plastics in the dehumidifier. So yeah, you could use a water generator though. Yeah, again, takes power to operate. Some can use as much power as an air conditioner or a fridge. Many are compatible with solar energy systems, however. So you could um, find that that is a good solution for you if you have solar. You could make a solar still. So water evaporates from the ground um, a solar still, da, da, da. they can trap water vapor. This is the basic idea behind transpiration, which is where you tie a bag around a bush or a branch and catch the moisture evaporating off of it. There are a couple different ways to do this. These methods can take a while, producing only a few ounces of water, but that is a lot better than dying of thirst in four days. Plus, you can purify dirty water using this method. Evaporation leaves behind most germs and toxins, leaving you a few ounces of clean drinking water. You can collect dew and fog, which, so there's kind of complex ways to collect dew and fog. Fog harvesters. A large installation can gather thousands of liters of water every day, perfectly fine for drinking. This person points out there's a big problem. Lots of researchers and nonprofits are working on ideas to address water scarcity. We can pull it out of the air. Um, you pull it out of the ocean using the sun to distill it. The biggest problem lies in mindsets and behaviors. Corporations and CEOs want to define water as a commodity, not a human right. They want to profit off of it, and the average Westerner wants to waste it. They don't understand what a precious resource it is. So you don't have to die of thirst. There are plenty of ways to get drinkable water. Oh, she mentioned these beetles earlier, and I kind of glossed over it, but there are like beetles that live in the desert that dew will collect on their bodies, and then they'll drink the dew off of their bodies, and that's how they stay hydrated in the desert. So that's kind of fun. You can easily collect dew with a hole, some plastic wrap or a piece of foil and a rock to weight it down. I just didn't realize before reading these articles that the predictions for water scarcity were that accelerated. Like it's 2023 right now. And they're predicting that by the end of this decade, you know, we'll be using like quite a bit more water than we have. And that in th less than 30 years, we're looking at 5 billion people having water scarcity. And that, so that's gonna creep up on us. It's gonna be like, increasingly there's water scarcity. And don't forget y'all, it's not like, and, and I wanna be clear, this is not something that you can blame on human individual behavior necessarily, because isn't water used in fracking? Like huge amounts of water are like pumped into the ground. Isn't that the whole fucking thing? So like, it's again, one of those things where like, yes, there are things, you know, washing machines and like long showers and stuff like that are luxuries that we spend a lot of water on, right? And at the same time, if we genuinely compared like everyone's laundry in the country um, compared to like industrial processes, yeah, 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 yeah. So listen, I just wanna be clear that I was correct. In the fracking process, cracks in and below the earth's surface are, are opened and widened. Hold on, I'm making bigger. In the fracking process, cracks in and below Earth's surface are opened and widened by injecting water, chemicals, and sand at high pressure. So we are like shooting water into the ground and mixing it with chemicals that make it undrinkable. And I say we, and by that I mean huge corporations are doing this. So just to be clear, yes, there are some issues with our societal lack of respect for resources. However, the more harmful thing and the thing that we should be focusing on is the harm that these corporations do by wasting our natural resources in this manner, right? By spilling chemicals in our water and thus reducing the overall amount of usable water in an area. And like, you know, these, like destroying the water supply effectively in Flint, Michigan, right? Like 
water scarcity is already happening in America, to be clear, and it already has been for like 10 years at least. That's how long it's been since Flint, Michigan was like on the news for having like water that's fucked up there. So it's not like water scarcity isn't already a thing that happens to us sometimes. It's just gonna become way more prevalent. If you live in a home, if you have like a setup where you could start like a homestead situation, then cool, yeah, you have like the resources to, you could build a well and maybe you could, you know, while you have a job that gives you money, you can install a filtration system, but also keep in mind that like, how are you gonna replace those filters if society collapses and they're not being made anymore? Like, make sure your filters can be cleaned, I guess. They can be like reused in that way or that it's made out of something that you can make more of. Like, you know, human hair is actually pretty good at like soaking things up and like filtering. You know, we use like big mats made out of human hair to soak up like oil spills. So, right, yeah, learn how to make my own activated charcoal filters. Yeah, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be crazy, this, this whole thing, sooner than you think. And it's good to start thinking about this and, you know, seeking out information on your own because you're not gonna hear about this on the news. And then suddenly there's gonna be just like way too much, like, stuff going on and like you will have not been preparing for it and like i would like to be still going strong in 30 years in 2050 i would like to feel like i am i have all that i need to continue surviving for a longer period of time i know people in their 60s who are like still going still enjoying themselves having a great time like i i'm like i call these people my friends i love them they're amazing um i don't want to feel like my life is over <laughs> when i'm 60 because climate change is making it so that like water is not accessible anymore. If society collapses, I'm just gonna check out TBH. I know you will, mama. I don't want to just check out. I will dig my claws in and sc like scratch myself out of whatever hole they try to bury me in. Like that's just the kind of person that I am. I am the, I am the, I'm the, sh I'm the airplane that comes back and forms a survivorship bias, okay? And I'm sorry. Yeah, it, the total amount of water on the planet doesn't really change. It's the amount of usable drinking water that changes. Even if the stuff is not like on the ground, it's gonna be in the air. And then it's only in the air as long as it takes for it to rain down. But keep in mind when we're having discussions about water, that we also read an article recently that stated Rainwater is basically not safe to drink anywhere on the planet anymore. It's not just in places where there's going to be a ton, a ton of smog, um, like big, big cities, but it's like anywhere in the world, basically, you should probably not drink the rainwater straight up without filtering it in some form or fashion. So this has been ongoing for a while. And it, and like, that's just to tell you, basically all fresh water sources are vulnerable to contamination. Gonna go back to drinking beer all the time because it's safer. True. Gotta kill all those microorganisms. Yeah, I agree on comfortable. Despite how bad climate change is and will be in my lifetime, I'm having this weird compulsion to be like, yes, it will be bad. And at the same time, I'm committed to doing all I can to make it livable for myself and as many other people as I can. Right. Like I have reasons for wanting to live in the Pacific Northwest anyway. And like one of the new reasons is because it's gonna be relatively climate stable there, like for the foreseeable future. I feel like I'm finally emerging from the other side of being a climate doomer. Yeah, I am like the opposite of a doomer right now. I'm like, I am so aggressively determined to live well. Draining wetlands and water tables is the big issue right now. Everything is polluted and filtering is expensive. And of course they just stripped at the Supreme Court level, they stripped federal protections from wetlands. So like Kansas has some wetlands that are relatively new and they're gorgeous and they're great. Like it's, um, it wasn't just plains here back in the day. Like, yes, we did have lots of plains um, prairie, but we also like did naturally have wetlands here, partially because the plains would hold on to so much water, um, and it would just form like wetlands because there's it's just retaining a lot of moisture in the soil, and yeah, it's part of our ecosystem. It's part of our natural fresh water production. I'm sure that the plants filter the water quite a bit and it's not good for those to be threatened. I feel good about the fact that I moved from Florida to Indiana because the Midwest is supposed to be relatively climate stable as well, especially compared to Florida. Definitely compared to Florida, James, but I saw a graphic that basically was like, 
here's a snapshot in 10 years, a snapshot in 20 years, in 30 and 40 years of basically whether these places are going to start having days where you cannot be outside for longer than 15 minutes without like medical problems imposed on you immediately. Like the average healthy person. You're basically in those places required to have air conditioning and be in the air conditioning or you are at risk of death on the like summer summertime of the year. And so I watched this graph kind of moving across or like a, it's almost like a radar map moving across the United States. And like where I live in Kansas is relatively climate stable or, you know, compared to a lot of places, sure. Um, not a lot of major climate events here. But yeah, it, it's showing in 40 years, there is going to be this thing where like you have to, you have to be inside or you will die. And like the air conditioners are going to be struggling to keep up and unhoused people will just die and you won't be able to go anywhere on those days or to like do anything like, yeah, congrats, stay home. We're, it's hibernation time. So, and I was looking at this thing in like 40 years and that little, that little sliver between the mountains and the sea in Washington, Bellevue, Seattle, Tacoma area is like green and it just stays green. Everything else is getting more red and orange and it just stays green. I was like, okay, so that it's like relatively stable there because you know, there's, the ocean and then the like mountains kind of creating this little pocket sort of. Thank you so much to my patrons and potential future patrons. I especially want to shout out Tiago Nascimento, Mersh Rolvog, Michelle Frateroli, Amanda B, Wellington Marcus, Michelle Winter, Danielle McDonald, Suzanne Maynard, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Past Null Infinity, Jamie Jam, Nova, Elizabeth Bartell, Sojo, Sarah A, Kevin Young, Athiet, Desi Quiche, Liam Hodgson, and Mr. Atheist.